Welcome to the ITDVDs.com YouTube channel. This is just a sample of the training available at ITDVDs.com. If you would like to see complete training, please go to ITDVDs.com. Now let's begin the sample. KMS stands for Key Management Service. And Key Management Service is something that runs on a Windows host. And instead of using Microsoft to activate our Windows 7 computers, our Windows 7 computers are now going to activate against this key management service. But we do need to activate the key management service, and we're going to do this through the Internet or through the phone. So we're going to use Microsoft's hosted activation service through the Internet or activate through the phone. But once our key management service is activated, with a KMS key, then all of our Windows 7 clients are just going to use that KMS server to activate. So important things to know about KMS is that it uses port 1688 by default. Now that we can change this, but this is the default port. And KMS also uses an SRV resource record in DNS, specifically the underscore VLMCS dot underscore TCP record. And this is how your Windows 7 machines find this KMS service in order to activate. So without this DNS record, they're normally not going to be able to find it unless we configure it manually for that Windows 7 machine to specifically find a specific KMS server. Now fortunately, if we have a volume licensing agreement where if we're using KMS, we do, and we're using Windows 7 volume license software, it's already configured by default to use a KMS server for activation. So we don't have to do anything. We just have our image, we send it out, and it's already going to look at DNS for your KMS server. It's going to look for this particular record, find it, talk to your KMS server, and get activated. Now KMS registers the SRV record using dynamic DNS. So if dynamic DNS isn't working or you've got it turned off or locked down in some fashion, then you may need to add the DNS record manually. And we'll take a look at that later on. And KMS clients, which are going to be your Windows 7 machines, and KMS clients can also be Windows Server 2008 R2, they use RPC to contact the KMS host. So this is important to know for your firewall rules. If you've got Windows Firewall on your Windows 7 machines, you need outbound going to 1688 to your KMS host, and it also needs to be able to get rep RPC replies from your KMS host. And your KMS server can activate physical hosts or virtual hosts. So Windows 7 machines that are actually running on a desktop or if they're virtual machines, it, it makes no difference. For your KMS service to actually activate clients, it needs at least 25 clients to try to activate before it'll actually activate them. And that's Windows 7 clients. If you're activating Windows Server 2008 R2, it only needs five. But this is kind of interesting. So the first 24 Windows 7 clients that try to activate against your KMS server, they're not going to be able to. But once that 25th client tries to activate, then, okay, all of a sudden all of your Windows 7 clients are going to be able to activate against your KMS server. So you need, you know, not a huge environment, but you need at least 25 computers in your environment to use KMS with Windows 7. One thing to note about the activation count is that it's cumulative. So let's say you're trying to activate Windows 7 computers, but you also have a couple of Windows Server 2008 R2 computers that are also activating against your KMS server. Well, if you have 23 Windows 7 clients and two Windows Server 2008 R2 clients, that's going to meet your required 25 clients to start activating Windows 7. Also, activations are valid for 180 days. So this is unlike your Mac key where you just activate and your computer is activated. It doesn't need to reactivate. But with KMS, it needs to contact the KMS server within 180 days. And this is called the activation validity interval. And clients attempt to renew every seven days. So even though they're not close to the 180 days, they're going to try after seven days to renew their activation. If the activation fails for some reason at that seven-day mark, it's going to retry every two hours. So pretty much, let's say you're gone for 90 days, you come back, you connect to the corporate network, and now you have access to your KMS server, well, it's going to activate 
and renew its activation within two hours. Now the activation count cache is where it gets this count from. And it stores the CMD, or I'm sorry, CMID, which is the client machine identification for 30 days. And it's going to store twice the number of CMIDs required. So let's say you have 100 Windows 7 computers that all activate. Well, it's only going to store 50 of them in the activation count cache because that's twice what is needed for your Windows 7 clients. And it's going to store them for 30 days. So if you think about this, you need at least 25 of those clients to renew their activation within those 30 days. Also, activation communication is only 250 bytes each way, so it's not going to chew up a lot of bandwidth on your network. And we can activate as a standard user, so you don't need to have administrative privileges to activate your Windows 7 machine. Now, your key management service can run on all sorts of different Windows operating systems. And whatever operating system it's running on, that's going to be called your host. Ideally, if possible, you want to run it on a Windows Server 2008 R2 server. But you can also run it on Windows Vista, but Windows Vista must be updated to support the expanded KMS client. And that's the same with Windows Server 2008. It must also be updated, and this is just a Windows update. It can run on a Windows 7 machine, a Windows Server 2003 machine, but the Windows Server 2003 machine must be updated with KMS 1.2, and that's just a downloadable installer. A single KMS host can support unlimited clients. It's very, very lightweight, and it can run with a lot of other th services like Active Directory, DNS, all that. It's very, very lightweight. Now, ideally, we want to have two KMS hosts for failover. So we don't just want one in case something goes wrong with it, and then all of a sudden, you know, our Windows 7 machines can't renew their activation. But there can be some issues with having two KMS hosts specifically related to DNS. Because if that first KMS host registers its DNS record using dynamic DNS, then the second KMS host that we bring up is not going to be able to modify that record. So we'll actually see how to give that second KMS host permissions to modify that DNS record. Now ideally we're going to want to use KMS with any computers that are connected regularly to our corporate network. And we may have situations where we need to put another KMS server in a remote location. And normally that's going to be if we have another office that has a lot of Windows 7 clients that has access to the internet but for some reason doesn't have access to the main office that has one of your KMS servers. So really, KMS is kind of going to be the preferred method. If we can't use KMS, then we look at using Mac. And realistically, you're probably going to end up using both in certain situations.